Hi, y'all. Welcome to Adventures with Aggie. I'm so excited because we have a super special episode. So today I spoke with Justin Avendano. He's a batsman for the Sydney Sixers, and the Sydney Sixers are on their way to the finals this Saturday. The game's at 3 a.m. my time, but I'll be up watching, and I can't wait. So I got to talk to Justin for 30 minutes during the week before their final match, and he shares a little bit about his story what the Sixers are doing and explains cricket because I think lots of us Americans are not super familiar with cricket, the rules, what a wicket is, what the different positions are. So he kind of walks us through all of those things as well as his story and what he's doing now and what he's doing to prep for the match on Saturday. So please welcome Justin. Justin, how are you doing today? I'm very good. I'm very good. I've had a lazy morning so far. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's almost the end of the day for me. So not quite having that lazy morning, but I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to start off your day with Adventures with Aggie. But um, I guess, can you just kind of start by giving me some background, who you are, where you're from and what position you play? Yeah. So obviously I'm Justin Amandano. Um, I'm a batter. Um, I started cricket when I was about nine years old. And my first memory was sort of accidentally falling into cricket when my mate forgot he had cricket trials and I didn't even know what cricket was when I was about nine years old. And I went and sat on the sidelines and watched him do the trials. And one of the dads come up to me and goes, come on, go and join the group. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And uh, that's how I sort of got started in the cricket, sort of just by luck. My mate forgot he had cricket trials when I was having like a sleepover when I was nine years old. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, so that's sort of how I got started. Um and then, yeah, I went down, not the professional route to start. Um, I left school and started a business with my family. Um, so my story is a little bit different, but I'm sure we'll get into that later on. Um, but yeah, that's sort of my little quick background of myself. Hey, that's an awesome accident. You accidentally found cricket and seems to be working out pretty well for you. So that's great. <laughs> it's worked out a lot, I think. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, cool. Well, I guess this is a backtracking a little bit, but um, can you kind of explain cricket to someone who maybe hasn't ever watched cricket before? As you know, it's not a common thing, I guess, in the U.S., at most parts of the U.S. Um, so, yeah, can you just kind of give, I don't know, whatever your definition of cricket yeah. would be? I, it's probably, I reckon, one of the hardest sports to describe because it's so complicated. Right. Um, we Australian, but I reckon that in America, it's probably closest to baseball where you've got a pitcher and you've got a batter um, and you've got fielders in the outfield. Um, in cricket, you sort of have these, you have two batters at the same time and you're running between the, one end to another. So in baseball, if I hit it, you're sort of rotating through. Um, you have three stumps. The bowler's trying to hit these stumps to get you out um, or caught in the outfield. Um, it's probably the closest thing to baseball is probably the easiest way to describe it because there's so many terms that if I said them today, you would have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's just go, it's close to baseball, but you have two batters and you rotate the pitches sort of every six balls, every six throws, the pitcher changes. So it's probably the easiest way to describe it. Yeah, definitely. I think every time, like I've watched plenty of cricket matches in my life just because I tried to learn it, you know, like I was like, this is going to be one of those things I'm going to figure out. And every time I hear someone describe it or I watch another like, explanation video I learned something else I'm like how many rules how many words are there that I don't know out there incredibly confusing where I like to watch your sports a little bit like the NFL and yeah. you pick up being like two or three games you sort of know exactly what the rules are and you know how it is with cricket I reckon you could watch it 100 games if you don't know what's happening you wouldn't have a clue what's going on yeah. so it's extreme yeah definitely I think the thing that's confusing for a lot of Americans is how long it is like yeah. that, I mean, I'm, I still, I'm still confused and I watch a lot of cricket. So <laughs> that I don't know. I have my friends, they'll stay up all night long watching some test match. And I'm like, that was six hours last night. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, and but, that is. yeah. That's insane. Yeah. That's insane. I've never seen a baseball game last for multiple days, but I get, it. I get the comparison. <laughs> <laughs> that thing is great. You can play five days, eight hours a day. And at the end of the, end of those five days it might not even be a winner so it just ends up in a draw so I guess that's another part of cricket that everyone just seems silly that you can play for five days and nothing yeah. nothing happens how I don't know how I would feel after five days and there's no winner like I don't know I guess in most American sports there aren't draws that's not 
a normal thing, I think, you know, like with MLS yeah. and NFL and stuff, like people like crave that winning situation. Yeah. But I struggle with that, whether it's cricket or even, I don't know, European soccer, football, whatever you call it. Like, I still struggle with that. I'm like, I watch 90 minutes and nobody. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't yeah, imagine not- five days. <laughs> no, it's not fun as a player either when you put in a lot of effort and then nothing happens sure. out of it just frustrated but sometimes they can also be some of the best matches because it gets really intense that both teams are desperate for a win and then nothing happens so it sort of builds up over you know three four into that fifth day so sometimes it can be exciting most of the time it's not (laughs) (laughs) that's sad but are these do the fans come out for five days straight is that yeah yeah like in big matches you'll get sort of the first three days at like the MCG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, you'll get like 80,000 people for big games. And then maybe on the fifth day, they might go down to about 30 or 40,000. Um, yeah. So some games like really build up on the fourth and fifth day. So potentially the crowds can get even bigger um, because you sort of draw into a conclusion, like something's going to happen. Um, but yeah, the fans do love it. That's awesome. I wish I had that. I want to do that here, but I don't think that's really not a thing, I guess, right now <laughs> in the U S no. that's so cool. I love that. Um, awesome. Well, we've kind of, I guess, already talked about this, the day long matches, multiple day long matches, but can you kind of just walk through your schedule on a match day? Like you wake up, what do you do all the way through the end of your match? So I guess, um, there's a couple formats that we play. So the T20 cricket, which is what mm-hmm. we're playing now in the final in, you sort of play, it's a three hour match. Uh, so it's over nice and quick. The, the hard part is when you wake up at like seven, eight in the morning and then you have to wait till seven at night to play. So you get a little bit nervous. A lot of the boys go for a nice long walk or they get into the gym or a lot of the guys try and actually get to bed at about three, four a.m. and they wake up later. So they're waking up at like maybe one, two in the afternoon. So that build up's not as you don't really, because you can't really do much. You can't really go and play a game of golf, which a few people do actually, but you don't want to be tired with, when you get to the game. So it's sort of that awkward, what do I do? I can't do too much. Um, so a few of the boys go for a walk, we get a coffee, go have some lunch. And then, um, yeah, then you're sort of preparing those from about five o'clock to seven o'clock. You're sort of at the ground. Um, you're looking at the wicket because every wicket's going to be different. So you're trying to figure out, you know, what, what the strengths are for the day are going to be. Is it going to be a batter's game, bowler's game? You sort of approach the other team. You have a little team meeting about, you know, who they are, what they're going to do, what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then, yeah, you sort of get in, get into the game, but it's sort of quite a big process with T20 cricket, where in like five-day cricket, um, you're up at 7 a.m. and you're at the ground at 8.30 playing by 10. So I prefer those games because there's nothing to think about. You don't you don't go crazy in your hotel room waiting. So, um, yeah, that, those days are a little bit better. Yeah, definitely. I, I never think about the different formats that you were talking about. That's something, I guess... I don't see very much over here either. Um, yeah. But cool. Okay. Wait, I wanted to ask you kind of a follow up to that. Can you talk about what the difference in a wicket means? Because I feel like the difference of wickets or something that's probably not a word that my listeners have heard very much. <laughs> um, so just like, what's a batter's game? What's a bowler's game? Like, what does, what are the differences there? So I guess if you will like to think of it, so we, we play on, we play on grass every, every single right. game. So, um, What's the best way to describe this? You play on wickets that have lots of grass. So if there's a lot of grass on the wicket, when the bowler hits the grass, the ball deviate a lot and it's really hard for the batsman. So that's more of a bowler's wicket where if the grass is, let's say, cut really low, uh, the ground's really hard, it's firm um, and the outfield's quick, it's much more of a batter's game um, because the ball's not going to deviate that much. Um, so that's one of the different things in a wicket, but essentially it's, it's just grass and dirt, and the harder it is, uh, and the less grass there is, more of a batter's game. Um, and then the more grass there is, the grander it is, probably more of a bowler's game. But then you go to, like, if you go to the subcontinent in India, there'll be no grass at all. It'll pretty much just be dirt, and it will turn a mile. So a spinner, put a lot of spin on the board, hit the ground and deviate massively. So there's all different types of conditions all around the world. Probably in Australia, we have the quickest and bounciest wickets, we probably the least amount of seed movement just because of the constant good weather we have. So it's very consistent uh, where you go to other parts of the world like England and it's consistently green and it's horrible to be a batsman. So you get all conditions different around the world. 
Yeah. I think that's something that I can tell too, just like when you Google like Australian cricket or Indian cricket, like you can see the difference, like within the the pitch, the wicket, like what exactly yeah. what you're talking about, which is so yeah. cool. And I'm always thinking like, I wonder what that's like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I've never tried it. So I don't know, but it's cool to hear your experience um, and just what that means and how that affects the game as well. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I guess this is definitely related to your game day, but do you have any like pre-match rituals, superstitions or things that you do? <laughs> uh, I used to be really bad when I was about, I reckon, 16 to maybe 20. I would have so many superstitions. It was ridiculous. So I, because as, as sports people, if you do well, you want to know, what did I do well in the morning? What did I do differently? Sure. And I remember going to the game and I did really well and I had bought a new pair of socks in the morning. Um, so then I, every single game I played, I had to go and buy a brand new, like I had to wear a brand new pair of socks. Um, the same meals every day. So I used to eat wheat beaks um, every single morning. I have this little ball and a stump type thing that I hit up against the wall. And I used to have to do that number of times to sort of, I thought it got my eye in. So everyone has their own little quirks. Um, now it's probably more routines for me than superstitions. I sort of got rid of them all. Um, except one, uh, which is my little ball and stump thing that I do. I don't know why, but I just keep doing it. I think it works. So sure. more of a routine now than um, focusing on superstitions because I used to have that many. It was ridiculous. Same meal the night before, in bed the same time. My alarm would be like a weird number, like wake up at 6.49. So I always used to have that, like I had to wake up to that alarm. Like it used to drive me insane, but I'm glad those are gone now. That's crazy. Yeah, that, that's good to hear that you've grown out of it and it hasn't just like accumulated. So you have this like crazy long list of weird things you have to do <laughs> for your magic. Yeah. But I think I have said this on a lot of my episodes, but I had one athlete um, who told me that his superstition, I don't know if it's a superstition or a ritual, probably both, but he would like peel an orange, eat the orange and then like keep the peel in his pocket. And like for the whole match. And I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know. <laughs> That's got to be a superstition. That's not a ritual. That. <laughs> Weird ones like that, they're, they're superstitions because there's a few people like that that have that and they're, they're, they struggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was like, I wouldn't want to smell like an orange the whole day. I don't think, but that's, that's besides the ritual point. That's super <laughs> But <laughs> maybe you, sh you could try that one and see what happens. I'm on but. Might work if we get out of form. I might try the orange in the pocket. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Wait, so what kinds of socks are you buying? Do you have like a specific brand? Like every you needed a new pair. Yeah, that's like it, that's it a was. So I got lucky that I scored runs in a cheap pair of socks. <laughs> so then I went, I went to Kmart and bought like I reckon for the year I bought. Well, I had like thirty games for the year, so I went and bought like thirty right. pairs. Um, but lucky they were the cheap ones. I was like $2 each. So I was like, oh, that's not too bad. I can warrant that. Um, these days, now that all those superstitions are gone, when you're in the field for five days, you want a half decent pair of socks. And now I use more expensive socks. So I hope I don't have a bad superstition of buying $30 pairs of socks every single game. So <laughs> let's hope that doesn't come. Oh my gosh. I was hoping, I don't know. You, I don't know if I, I thought you were going to say like Nikes or something. Like you go out by Nike Elites every nah, single match. That was crazy. I'm at two dollar socks. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. I love that. I I have also bought socks from Kmart, but I like their holiday packs. You should try those. They have Santa Claus on them. So many. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> well, it's one of the, crick the cricketers. Speaking of superstitions, I play with him. He wears like same thing. He wears um, superhero socks. So all these socks have like Batman, Superman, <laughs> Spider Man, and they have it, like all in the socks. So he's got to be a superhero when he's out there. So. There's a few that. weird things going around. I love that. I love that though. Like I, that's like channeling the whole character too. <laughs> yeah. the whole day. <laughs> but that's awesome. Um, cool. Okay. So this is a little bit of a transition, but if you didn't play cricket, what would you be doing? Like if that so, wasn't your profession, what would you go so into? I'm, I reckon I'm one of the maybe unlucky ones when I was young that I didn't fall into it straight away. But then I was also very fortunate that I got to set up a career outside of cricket. Um, for those first like five years, I was not really focusing on it. Um, so I've got my own business with my brother and my father. Um, and we got fish, we sell fishing and camping gear around Australia. We got stores around the country. 
Um, so I've been very fortunate to be involved in that. Um, and that's probably one thing that I would tell a lot of people if they're young um, to try and do a degree through it. And I think a lot of older cricketers are still doing it now. They, they wish they did a degree as well back then because when you're 33 and you go to retire, you might not have anything under your belt where I was sort of the opposite. I sort of started in a business and when cricket ends up for me, I've still got a good business to go back to. Um, so I'm probably one of the luckier ones, but then also I missed out on a lot early. Um, and that's just because I developed late. We can't all be stars at 18, 19. Um, but yeah, like that's what I do. I'll be in there. I'll be selling something. I'm a horrible salesman. So I'll be, I'll be doing something like that. There's plenty of time to refine your salesman skills. But, <laughs> yes. uh, that's really cool that you have that to fall back on. Um, even if your path wasn't as straight, I think as a lot of people think that athletes just have that, right? Like you're born kicking a soccer ball. Okay. You're going to, you're going to play soccer or something like that. But um, that's really cool though. You fishing gear. Are you a big fisherman too? Is this a hobby? It is a hobby. I'm terrible at it. So I don't know why I went into business but it was a good idea at the time and it somehow paid off but yeah I've never actually camped either so 6% of that is probably camping I've never camped a day in my life um so I'm not really sure what led me down that path but uh maybe it was just a good business idea and yes. I thought there was a something in the market that we could do and I thought oh, I probably should start camping but I like camping at hotels really <laughs> It's liking the idea of it, right? Like the idea of the idea is incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. I'm also really bad at fishing. I think I've gone fishing twice with my grandpa in my life and I didn't catch a single yeah. fish. Um, my little sister though, she's really good at it. She was blowing me out of the water. Like she had so many fish. I felt Luck. so Luck. mad. Yeah. It was not my day, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, cool. Okay. Let's go back. I guess back to the pitch for a second. So I'm pretty sure some of these cricket grounds, y'all share grounds with Aussie rules, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in the, so pretty much in the summer, um, it's cricket dominated. So it's cricket for six months and then it straight away transitions into Aussie rules. Um, and they need the big grounds. It's not like, so your rugby union or rugby league um, or like the NFL where they're straight hundred meter fields by 70. They're sort of 170 by maybe, 130 wide like the dimensions so um it's shared throughout the year and when the wickets um the back end of the su back end of the summer they just let the grass grow out and they just seed it with a thicker grass but um yeah like it's all shared with Aussie rules which is a good thing and a bad thing because when you get to the early in this season after rugby's been on or footy's been on it for six months it's yeah. um it's tough going but then through the summer it's amazing but yeah we share it with both both formats yeah that's I remember from when I was in Sydney um I was there in the summer but I remember we had a tour guide at the SCG and he was telling us about how like the middle of the of the pitch was raised something. yeah Is that right yeah and he was like this this affects it's different for each sport and like how that's a benefit or not um, so I guess that's kind of what I was thinking. And like, is that hard? Like, I don't know. I've never played once again. So I don't know. I've never played either Aussie rules or cricket. So, um, yeah, I guess what is that? They're all different. Like you said before, the grass is all yeah. different, but, um, yeah. how does the, the sharing a pitch impact that? So the, the reason they're raised is so uh, with, um, 40, it doesn't matter if it's rain, hail, shine, you play with yeah. cricket. Um, obviously if it's raining, you have to go off the field because it becomes dangerous because the, this little tiny ball gets really slippery. And you don't want to, one, injure the batsman, but two, you don't want the bowlers sliding around on the field because it's just going to be prone to injury. So they're raised maybe, I don't know, probably about a foot over sort of a 30-metre stretch. So when you lay the covers down, the main pitch doesn't get wet um, because the minute the pitch gets wet with rain for about 10 minutes, game over. It doesn't dry in time. So you just they're just raised, so you have to put the covers down and you sort of get a game if there's a little bit of rain around. Um, but in terms of changes in the oval, they sort of stay the same. That's pretty much the same element everywhere around the world. Um, okay. So you sort of do that little raise and then everything's sort of feeding down from that. Um, so that's pretty consistent around the world. But it's all these little things you're asking me, which we don't even pay attention to. Like I would never tell someone why the wicket's raised. Um, but it, I guess it is really intriguing when you go to different parts of the world. People want to know this and they want to know why they do certain things. So. It's weird talking about like why the cricket's raised because 
I've never really spoken to football. I, yeah, I mean, I just think I don't see any football fields here that are raised at any part. You know, that's like a very normal thing for them to be super flat. So when I was touring the SEG and he's like, oh no, this part is like significantly higher than the other part. I was like, that's why, like, <laughs> why would yeah. you want that? Cause I think the ball rolling or something like, I don't know, downhill to me, that means rolling or people falling or something. He's like, no, it's not that much, but <laughs> yeah, it's, there, there is one ground in England, which is the home of cricket. I think the first of a test match got played there okay. maybe 130 years ago. Was, oh, don't know, but somewhere around there. And yeah. there's a mass to the ground i remember going there and you walk and you're like that's actually a massive slope um and it's probably one of the only grounds professional grounds in the world that has it's probably a good meter or two of constant slope throughout the ground um and you always hear about it on tv but you can't really see it until you go there you're like how are people doing this like it's like people are running up and down hills so <laughs> there's different grounds that have very different uniques about them and probably that one's the most famous for it yeah sure i i don't like running on flat ground so i couldn't imagine how that would be running up or downhill <laughs> but well there's my home ground here at north sydney oval it has a tree on it um and it sort of comes over the grandstand and it's a really famous tree so they're never going to get rid of it but if a ball goes in the tree it's automatically six um so, cool. so yeah it's, it doesn't come over too far but it definitely like comes over the ground at, a, at the back of it so that's sort of another little unique about some grounds yeah that's awesome it, you know it's not going anywhere the tree was there before y'all so <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. get rid of it um cool well i know y'all changed pitch locations quite a few times recently right yeah um how has that been i don't know getting used to having a different home grounds um i'd imagine that's difficult as a team um but yeah how's that been so far yeah i think um some teams really struggle with that and i think the balance of our team especially is probably why we've done well um we love being on the road it's sort of one of our little yeah. slow we love being on the road because we win we're a team we're together and we're really diverse like every player is i don't know how to describe it to you but we're very flexible and we can adapt really quickly um, we might not be the biggest and strongest hitters of a cricket ball. So when you get to this really perfect cricket pitch for batsmen, um, we, not, we might not get the highest total, but we'll figure out a way of how to win because every one of our batsmen, oh, let's, let's say our cricket intelligence is pretty well. Um, it's pretty good. Um, so I think that's why we love being on the road. And once again, we, we haven't played one game at home this year and we're top of the table. So I think that shows that we're pretty good at adapting. Um, but there are some grounds where it is really hard to adapt because especially for guys playing for Australia going overseas, that's when it changes massively. So if you go to India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, or you go to the UK, South Africa, they're all very different. Like, right. So what we get here, they're all very similar, probably bar one wicket in WA, which is extremely bouncy. Um, so it takes a lot of getting used to, but it's more when you go to the subcontinent and you play on a pitch that you've never seen before. It reacts totally differently. Um, there's a massive advantage to the home team. Where in Australia, it's probably not that big. Um, you just We just sort of miss the comfort of being at home. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. But we love being on tour. We do well on tour. Um, so we're not too fussed, to be honest. Yeah, I, I realize yeah, y'all are killing it. So I don't think <laughs> must not have affected you that much. Um, no. Yeah, I think the maybe the biggest difference is probably for the fans, right? Like not having that home ground um, always, which is hard. But I know y'all also can have fans at your matches, and we aren't really at that stage right now. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd imagine this different um, feeding off of the fan audience, or yeah, not, well, I guess. Well, this is, I think, are. Uh, I think we have the biggest fan base. Um, so it has been really hard going away and never playing in front of your fans because you just get that certain buzz when you're at your home ground. Yeah. Um, people aren't legend you 24-7. Um, so when you when you go away to the other grounds and you can hear all the fans just abuse you constantly. Um, and since there's not full houses at the moment, there may be 30 to 50% capacities, you can sort of hear individuals in the crowd and, so if people want to sledge you, you can hear it clear as day. So that's probably the biggest thing we miss is just being at home and not getting abused by the fans the whole time. 
Um, but at the same point, you sort of laugh it off a little bit because some of the stuff they say is pretty funny and you, you just got to laugh it off. <laughs> that's crazy. I That's what I, I remember experiencing, I guess not as a player, but as a fan, is at like Yankee Stadium. I always sit in the outfield. It's the cheapest tickets, right? I go sit in the back. And there's always like that poor center fielder, like standing right there next to the fans. <laughs> like, man, he's just getting it all, like everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine it's going to get worse once we are allowed to have a few fans back in the crowd. But yeah, yeah I guess got to laugh it off. And at this point, we're probably probably used to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest, they, it's when they get the chance going, they start singing songs. That's when you really enjoy it. The the little abuse attacks from one individual that they can get annoying. But when the chant are and they sing songs and it's like, well, this is all a bit of fun. Yes, they, the passion is there, whether it's for you or against you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I love it. Um, cool. Well, you've got a pretty big game coming up. Um, I'm shocked that we're having this conversation this week, actually. But um, <laughs> I guess, what are you doing from now until Saturday? Saturday? Is yeah, yeah. Saturday so we got, uh, we, got a, we got a few days off. Um, so today is one of our rest days. We traveled yesterday. Um, I guess that's one of the big things is that when you – when we haven't been home for nine weeks, I think you really need to relax on your rest days. Um, and I think that's been really good with our, um, with our coach letting us do what we want on these rest days and just totally forgetting about cricket. And then I think we get back into training tomorrow. We'll do a light run around catch field, um, have a bat, have a bowl, but pretty light, nothing too intense um, because it has been a long season. We have been on the road to um, a fair while, so you don't want to sort of ramp things up too much. You just want to keep doing what you've been doing. Um, and then Thursday, day off, Friday, light run around again, and then game day, Saturday. So it's it's not too busy, to be fair, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm going to try to be awake for the match. <laughs> I think it's at like 3.30 a.m. my time, no. but... I want to watch. I want to be a part of it from the other side of the world. Um, but yeah, I'm so excited for y'all. I'm glad you got some rest this week. But um, I think that'll be super fun. I can't wait to watch. Hopefully, if I'm awake. Um, <laughs> the alarm. Set the alarm. Yes, I'll take a nap and then I'll nap again after the match. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't wait. Um, cool. Okay, last question. I think you already answered this a little bit, but I end my shows on advice um, every single show. So can you just kind of reiterate um, what you said before about the advice you'd give to people maybe looking to build their career, whether in sport or not, because you've done both. Um, but yeah, what advice would you give to young people? Well, I think the biggest thing, especially from me, is I sort of lost a bit of love for the game because I was working so much. And then I actually took about two years off cricket um, just because I stopped enjoying it and I don't know why that was. I think I just put maybe a bit too much pressure on myself. And then when I came back to cricket, it's sort of when everything started happening for me purely because, sounds a little bit cliche, but I was just having fun. I didn't play the sport to do well, to do bad. I just wanted to have fun with my mates. And then you find that passion again when you're around a good group and you've got a good culture and then you want to train harder, you want to do the best things, you want to eat well. Everything sort of builds up to that if you're just having a good time. As soon as you put too much stress in yourself or you everyone's going to fail. And in these sports, you probably fail more often than you succeed. So you got to enjoy the failures. Um, so I think that was probably the biggest thing is just to let everything go and have fun. Um, as silly as it sounds, it's, it's probably the reason, well, it is the reason I'm here today because I did give up the game. Um, and I purely came back just to hang around my mates. Um, I play a fair bit of golf and it can get boring at times. So it's because a very individual sport. Yeah. And I thought, I just need to get back on my mates. Um, and that's sort of all how it progressed. It progressed really quickly too. Um, as soon as I started having fun, I started scoring a lot of runs. I started doing the right things. And all of a sudden you get a phone call that you're going you know, to be playing for the Sydney Sixers. So um, it was a really weird, weird transition. But I think the biggest thing is just to enjoy yourself because if you're enjoying yourself, there's no pressure. The minute you start putting pressure on yourself, it's tough. So the biggest thing is just to have fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I love to see when athletes have like that passion and the fun and the love behind it. And they're not just doing it because they're good at it. Like, of course, yeah. it helps. if you are good at it, great. But <laughs> I think you, having that passion need, behind it helps. You, de you definitely need it. You need the passion yeah. because otherwise you're not going to be motivated to train. And there are quite a few people, even that I know professionally, that are purely playing it because they're good at it. 
um, and they are free and they free it, but they don't love it that much. Mm-hmm. Um, so they still are a little handful of individuals, but to be the best, uh, you got to love the game. Like Steve Smith, who was mm-hmm. our old Australian captain um, and probably the best batter in the world. He can't stop thinking about cricket 24 seven. Like he's crazy about it. Like that's his life. He's invested in it completely and he loves every single minute of it. He'll be watching, he'll be watching like club cricket games when he's playing for Australia just to see what's happening. Like it's weird, but you know, if you want to be the best, fully invest yourself. Um, yeah. And he just, he just loves the game. So yeah. yeah. I love it. I love that. I love the passion. It makes me excited. Um, awesome. Well, Justin, this was great. Thank you so much for taking time out of your rest day. I'm honored to be 30 minutes of your time, <laughs> but thank thanks, you. thanks so much. And I wish you the best this weekend. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Justin, thank you so much for sharing your story and giving us a little bit of an insight into cricket and your experience with cricket on this very special week. I know I'm rooting for you, cheering for the Sixers in the middle of the night for my time. But yeah, thank you so much. And y'all stay tuned. Tomorrow we have a really cool episode with Lee Eagle, who is an NYU professor, and he's going to speak a little bit about an analysis on the Super Bowl and the impact of hosting a Super Bowl on host cities, as well as some of the changes and things that we might see this year with COVID. But stay tuned for another episode of Adventures with Aggie tomorrow.